Let's bow our heads now. Father God, that's our sincere prayer tonight. Seeing all that you are doing for the people in this day. And we ask you, Lord, may we only believe. Just believe it's the truth, the written word being made manifest to us. Grant these things, Father. Now tonight, we want to thank you for the the light that you throwed on the Scriptures for us this morning. Yes, Lord. And we pray tonight, Lord, in the prayer line, that you will vindicate your word to be the truth. We pray for all the churches and the congregations that's gathered around the, the, the little microphones out across from the nation all the way to the West Coast, up into the mountains of Arizona, down into the plains of Texas, way into the East Coast, all across the country, Lord, where they have gathered. Many hours apart we are in time, but, Lord, we're together tonight as one unit, believers waiting for the coming of the Messiah. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll send him soon for your church. For we ask that in his name, amen. You may be seated. Christian greetings to all that's here tonight. <clears throat> I'm sorry that we're still jammed and packed till we can hardly breathe. Even the air conditioners, as well as this air conditioning, doesn't have much effect. So many people, if it was hardly just a normal church full of people, those air conditioners would freeze you. But now, everyone's got a fan fanning, and the air conditioners blowing as hard as they can. We send greetings from the East Coast to the West to all our friends in Christ who's listening in. We send greetings over in San Jose, Brother Borders, the group up there. We send greetings up in the mountains, Prescott, Arizona, to Brother Leo Mercer and his group that's up there waiting for the coming of the Lord. We send greetings to those in Tucson that's gathered tonight waiting for the coming of the Lord. Down in Houston, Texas, to those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord. Up in Chicago, to those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord. Up on the East Coast, New York and Connecticut, and the great groups up there that's waiting for the coming of the Lord. We don't have room here to seat them, so we just have to send them the word through the, the medium of the telephone. We send greetings to Brother Junior Jackson tonight and his group down in Clarksville. Brother Ruddle up on 62 and his group waiting for the coming of the Lord. And we're gathered here tonight at the home church, the tabernacle, waiting for the coming of the Lord. And now, many of you maybe wasn't at the services this morning, but I trust that everyone that wasn't will get that tape. For I believe that it was the most straightest message to the church since the, the message of sirs, what time is it? I felt the anointing of the Spirit, felt led to say what I did. It was long, but yet I felt led to do it. And I think the Lord by His Word showed that what hour we're living. And to make sure that we understand these mysterious things that's happening. You know, the Bible said, the wise shall understand. But the nations and the people will grow weaker and wiser. Just think the average American now is in middle age about 20 years old. Weaker, but wiser. They didn't have jet planes in them days and, and atomic warheads, but they lived a lot longer. We're getting weaker and wiser. And our own wisdom... It's what's going to destroy us. We will destroy ourselves. God will not destroy us. Our wisdom will destroy us. It's always been that way, and so will it be again. Now, the Lord willing, next Sunday morning, not knowing now what I will speak on, but I trust that the Lord, if He lets us live and nothing happens, and it be His will, 
We aim to speak another message next Sunday morning, have prayer for the sick next Sunday night. Then it falls my lot to return back home to Arizona to take the family back so that the children can register in school. Then you, we'll notify you just as we can of the meetings as they mature or the times that we have places that we aim to be. So God bless you all. Now tonight, knowing that it's I'm 15 minutes late to begin with, quarter till eight here in Jeffersonville, and um, that's about a quarter to nine at, at the East Coast, and then it's about five o'clock on the West Coast. So now we are just about sundown here, and I want to speak to you for just a short service to try to find the anointing of the Spirit and then call the prayer line. And I want the congregation here as well as the congregation assembled at other places. Find some man, some brother that's anointed by the Spirit. And when we start praying for the sick, go lay hands upon those that's in your congregation. Remember, God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. So down in Texas, over in California, up in Arizona, wherever you are, lay hands on those that are sick when we start praying for the sick. And I'm sure God will hear and answer prayer. Strange thing last Sunday night, and the anointing was going on, and the Holy Spirit is quiet, a thing I hadn't had a, a line of discernment for months and months since I was here the other time. Then to walk up there under a promise, you don't know that he'll do it. You can't say he'll do it. You just got to walk up there and wait. He's sovereign. He does what he wants to. But stand there and wait to see what he will do. Then feel it break through on you like that. And at the end of the, the meeting, not knowing who it was, but there'd been a, a man somewhere along the line that was tall, bald on top, and he was a very sick person. Then right at last, there was a man appeared here on the platform and had his head down and looked like he was suffering, holding himself around the stomach. And I thought, that must be that first man or second man or whatever it was that I prayed for him because he was bald and was holding his head down. A large man stooped over but I looked around, and I found the gentleman sitting out there, but he was rejoicing. I thought, where is it? I couldn't decide where it was at. I could feel it and see the man before me. I felt it pull around this way, and it was coming from back. I looked at Brother Neville, and these two sitting here, it wasn't them. I said, the man is on the inside of that baptistry back there. And you know who it was? Brother Shepherd. The reason I couldn't recognize him, he's sitting back there with his head bowed. Praying. He thought he was going to die. Has thought that for the last few weeks. His wife told him, go get a new pair of shoes. And he said, I won't need them. I won't be here that long. And he met me the other day in the, up there in the yard. Brother Woods is shouting and praising God. said, I'm eating bacon, eggs, tomatoes, anything I want. <laughs> and humbly giving up his seat, getting back in there, out of the way, and praying. See? You don't need a prayer card. You only need faith, see. I didn't know whether he was healed or not. I just said, uh, a man praying has got something wrong. I think he called what it was, stomach trouble. And praying back behind here. The Lord Jesus make you well. Now that's all I could tell. The pool was that he was praying. I could see it, but what happens, I don't know. See, but when you see it, come back. Everybody's aware. When it says, Thus saith the Lord. See, that's not me speaking no more than. That's Him. But I always say, Jesus Christ has made you whole. That's exactly the truth. He was wounded for our transgressions. With His stripes, we were healed. See? See? But when it comes, Thus saith the Lord, and tells you what to do and what's going to happen, watch that. It'll be that way. But when I say, Jesus Christ heals you, makes you whole, you believe it. Because he's already said it. I'm just repeating what he said. And a vision is just repeating what he showed. You understand? Now, may we 
hurry up and get right into the Word. Because I know that many of you are here, got long miles to travel tonight. I pray that God will bless you, help you, and protect you along the roads. And now, I wish to turn tonight to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter, and verses 1 to 11 in St. Matthew. And now, if you don't have your Bible, or if you want to jot down these scriptures, all right. Now, to you who never heard the message this morning, and you have a tape recorder, we never solicit selling tapes. We never solicit selling anything. Sometimes in a big meeting, they'll announce they got some books back there. We don't make anything out of them. Brother Vale's a writer. The tapes, the man operates a tape business there, will tell you. We don't make no tape money. We don't take the tapes. It's the message. And when a man gets on his mind that it's money, he ain't going to make tapes no more. <laughs> That's right. I asked about it. I think our tapes sell about under $5 or something, three to five or something like that. What I say? Three and four for them big long tapes. And a certain minister, I uh, asked about one of his tapes and it was $9. <laughs> about 20 minutes or 30 of a message. So I see that our brother Softman back there is not getting rich, any of them, on these tapes that they're, they're putting out. See, they make just enough to get by on it. Can't ask them to make them for nothing because they have to buy the tapes and everything else. And the machinery is very expensive. It costs about $10,000 to get set up to make those tapes to begin with. Now, I understand soon I haven't announced it yet, but there's a tape hearing again. Ever so often, we, uh, the trustees, I have nothing to do with it at all. I don't even number it in none of the meetings. It's another mere pro or con. They turn in their bids. The trustees decide who is the next man to make tapes, and they send them a letter. That's all I know about it. They take care of that because I can't even dedicate babies, let alone take care of tapes. So, or baptized. So I've got my mind set on this message. That's that third pull, and it's the one I must be loyal and reverent to. Matthew 21 1 to 11. I said that so you could be watching for the, or turning to the Scriptures. And when, the, and when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and straightway he will send them. This was all done, that it might be fulfilled which is spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughters of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, setting upon an ass, and the uh, Hold the fold of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And they brought the, the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way, and others cut out branches from the trees and strew them in the way. And the multitude that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Now if I would take a text from that for about 30 minutes before the prayer line begins. I would like to take this for a text. What is the attraction on the mountain? Now, it had been a very weary, nervous day. And it's an unusual day. We find Jesus here coming up to Jerusalem ready to attend the Passover, and the Passover is where the Paschal Lamb was killed and the blood 
was spread upon the mercy seat for the, uh, the atonement for, of, for the people. And he had come up from Bethphage and had come to the top of the Mount of Olives, which looks down upon another little hill where Jerusalem was built. And as he looked and know that this was his final visit. This was the time that when he would be delivered into the hands of sinful man and they would kill him, he would die the horriblest death that was ever died by a mortal and be buried, he'd be betrayed by his own, some of them standing right with him and him being God knew what was in their hearts and knew from the beginning who would betray him. And know that man was with him who sat by his side and counted his money to him and so forth. Know that man would betray him. And knew that a cruel Roman cross waited for him out there. He knew that his water and his body and the blood of his body would separate. And the blood would drop off of his forehead. Great big drops like perspiration. He knew all that was before him. And he stands upon the mountain looking over to Jerusalem. The people of that day, the, what they called that day a better religious class of people, hated him. The churches of that day hated him and denounced him and denounced all that listened to him. And if they went and attended his campaigns, they were immediately excommunicated from the fellowship of the church. No wonder the scripture said he came unto his own, and his own received him not. The ones who ought to have loved him, the ones who ought to have been for him, was his bitter, bitterest enemies. And he had made up his little group out of a bunch of poor people, fishermen, tax gatherers, uneducated. The Bible said some of them was even ignorant, unlearned. Some could not even sign their name. He never went to the churches to get his people. And he never agreed with any of the church leaders. And besides that, he followed the very trend of a prophet. He condemned everything that they'd done. As the ones before him had, because they were a portion of the word, and he was the word in its fullness. But in the midst of all of it, through every age and every prophet that had been or would be, there's going to be a certain amount of people that's predestinated to hear that message. And they'll follow it. Those ignore the crowds. They ignore the criticism of the unbeliever. They, they have no argument with them. They've got one thing to do that's believe. And to get every bit of it they can. Soak it in. Like Mary, who sat at the feet of Jesus. And Martha was fixing his dinner. And Jesus said to her, But, Martha, you are so concerned about the things of life. But Mary has sought the better things. See? The things of eternal life. Now we find that many of the people that I'd understood... They didn't have uh, literature as we have today. They didn't have television or telephones or anything of that day. But it had been kind of breezed around that he was going to be at the Passover. For many of the people, being spiritual minded, knew that he was that Passover lamb. Because he'd already told them the things that was going to happen. And then, of course, knowing that he was to be there and loved him the way they did, they was waiting for him. There was a crowd that was probably pushing, shoving from one gate to the other, watching out in every way, for they knew that one of the hours he would appear. They were watching. Others were wondering what was the matter with these people, running from gate to gate. What's the attraction? And they would look this way and look that way to find out it looked like they were looking for something. 
under expectation of something going to happen. Oh, how I would like to change my text for a few minutes and say this, that that's what's the matter today. The people who are looking for Him coming is under great anticipation and expectation. We can feel it. The pressure. And they're seeking, watching every move and every sign, comparing it with the Scriptures. And when they've seen all those things that was predicted of Him, right up to the end, they know the end was nigh. They wanted to be there. So they watched. Part of the crowds was for Him, in the minority. Some was against Him, most of them. Ninety percent was against Him. And that's about the way it is today. In the religious crowds, when it really come down to the Word and Christ, there's about one percent that would believe it. The other part wouldn't pay attention to it, no matter what was done. They'd pass off some kind of a joke or throw a slam about it. Just about the same. Th things don't change very much. History just repeats itself around. Well, we find that draw a nervous tension. It had to. It must do it. They were waiting. They were wondering what he would do when he got there. They wanted to be there to get anything that he'd done. They wanted it. They wanted to see it. They believed him. Others had heard he was coming, and they went up there to make fun of him. So after all the nervous anticipation, a very unusual day, very unusual time, church is asleep, the people's nerve was on age, there were so many people there. Then it happened. On top of Mount Olive come a little white donkey coming walking down the hill with a group of people fanatically screaming, pulling off palms, leaves off the trees, throwing their clothes in the road, screaming, Hosanna to the Son of David that comes in the name of the Lord. The, this little mule, his rider was none other than God's anointed Messiah of the hour. God then, what was he doing? What is that attraction up there on the hill? It's God making history and God fulfilling prophecy. And that always causes an attraction. It brings all the critics up, the vultures of this morning's message, and the eagles also. See? They come together to find out what's going on. Some coming for curiosity. Some coming to find fault. Others coming to criticize. There's all kinds gathered, as we said this morning, believers, make-believers, and unbelievers. What's on the mountain? Prophecy is being fulfilled. Now, we'll see what takes place. Now, in the book of Zechariah, in the ninth chapter and the ninth verse, Zechariah, one of the prophets, spoke in the Spirit, saying this, Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion! Shout, O daughters of Jerusalem! Behold, thy King cometh unto thee. He is just, having salvation." lowly, and riding upon an ass, upon the foal, a colt, the foal of an ass. Now, what was the matter with those scribes? What was the matter with those priests? What was the matter with those religious people? This was wrote 487 years before it happened by a vindicated prophet and was already put into writings and called the Bible, the scrolls of the Old Testament. Why couldn't they see that that's prophecy being fulfilled? The same reason they can't see it today. They took the Word of God and made it of none effect to the people by teaching for traditions 
for doctrine the traditions of man. And of scribes, preachers, ministers, spiritual men so-called, anointed ones, would only read the Bible. They wouldn't be wondering what's taking place. They would know what it is. God fulfilling His Word. History was being made. Prophecy was being fulfilled. Salvation to the world was arriving. The great day that all the prophets had looked forward to. All that was in the grave was waiting for that day. Think of it. All that had died. All the righteous of the blood of the martyrs and the prophets which had just screamed out, Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem. You that stone every prophet that ascend to you and kill the righteous, how oft would I have hovered you as a hen that would have brewed, but you would not. But now your hours come. Everything that was in the grave, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the prophets were waiting for this hour. And the church was blind to it. Who is this? It's caused all this noise. Who is that fellow that said one time, is not that the carpenter's son over here? We know him. Where did he get this wisdom? While we don't see him connected with any of our schools, we don't know any books he ever learned from. Who is it? He was the answer of the prophet's prophecy. Here he comes, riding upon the foal of an ass. What an attraction. God was fulfilling his promised word. The hour that have been waiting since 4,000 years. And Genesis, the third chapter and the 15th verse, God had made the prediction, the seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head, but his head shall bruise her heel. That prophecy down through the Bible that had been predicted of this man coming. And here, just recently, there was a prophet who stood up among them that was vindicated the prophet, Zechariah, and he said that you daughters of Jerusalem and you daughters of Zion, rejoice, shout, scream out, for your king comes to you, meek and lowly and humble, riding upon the foal of an ass. And you are those people that read that scripture day by day, watched him come riding in and cried, who is this? God fulfilling His Word to the people that should have known what it was, but they didn't know it. When God fulfills His Word, it always causes an attraction. Always does. Causes an attraction. For it is the unusual, so unusual when He fulfills His Word to the modern trend of the day. Because the modern trend of the day don't believe in it. They have their own way. Now, we see, and let us go back in the Scriptures and take some other unusual events. Just for a, a few more minutes. When God fulfilled His prophecy, when God says anything, He's going to do it. All heavens and earth will pass away, but that Word can never pass away. So, it usually causes a scene, an unusual scene. Notice how ridiculous that the Word of God to a, a people who's supposed to believe it, and yet it's so unusual they cry, out, Well, what's this? Where'd you get that stuff? Who is this? What is this? When they ought to have been screaming, Hosanna! To the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. But there's just a little group doing that. Just a little group. Of a 4,000 years of prophecy. For the greatest thing that could ever happen to the nation. For all the hope of the dead rested upon it. All the future laid in it. And the religious people that claim they believe it was screaming out, Who is it? 
And what's this attraction? Something unusual. About the same. You just don't change. The unusual. Let's see some of the unusual things that I just said. What was the attraction just before judgment struck the world and destroyed it by water? An old man, around 120 years old, building a boat when there was no water to float it in. <laughs> Up there for years, standing in the door, building away on the interior on the inside and pitching it inside and out and say the world's going to be swallowed up with water. The great scientific age. What is that pounding up on the hill up there? Why, it's an old man by the name of Noah. And he's up there, the old fanatic. The old man stood in the sun too long. He's sunstroked. He's out of his mind. And he's building what he calls an ark. And saying the waters is coming from up there where there is no water. And it's going to float all the people around and everybody that don't hear his message and everybody that won't come into that ark is going to be drowned. Did you ever hear of such a thing? It was an unusual attraction. I imagine when the people wanted a good laugh, they went up and stood before the ark door and laughed. Why, you said it was going to rain a hundred years ago. Grandpa told me he heard you up here saying it's going to rain. And you're still beating around on this old piece of wood up here. Why don't you get next to yourself? But it was God. Getting ready to confirm a promise. And to fulfill a prophecy that his prophet had made. Very unusual. God fulfilling his promise to Noah. While others was laughing. God was also getting ready to make history to show to others even to this day that He keeps His Word. No matter how unreal it seems unreasonable, He still keeps His Word. He was making an example out of that old man pounding on that ark for these people here in America tonight and all over the world. No matter what science says, what they say, this, that, or the other, he still keeps his word. He was making history. What was the attraction one day? An unusual thing happened back in the wilderness. And it was a bush that was on fire. And a runaway prophet was standing down in the wilderness. He never heard no voice. Never heard no sound, but he looked and seen an unusual thing up on top of the mountain. God was trying to attract his attention. Same is it today. God was getting ready to fulfill his word by his prophet Abraham. Your seeds shall sojourn 400 years in a strange land. I'll bring them out with a mighty hand. And he was preparing a man for the job as he was preparing an ark for a safety place for all who would believe. God put this bush on fire and this sheep herder, Moses, said, I will just turn aside to see what this strange thing means. And when he got Moses up to the bush, he spoke to him. What was the attraction later in the pilot's hall when this sheep herder throwed down a stick and it turned into a serpent? God fulfilling His promise to Moses. What was the attraction at the Dead Sea? When Pharaoh's horses was all astonished. When they seen a wind come down from the heavens and part the Red Sea from right to left. And a poor bunch of slaves walking in the duty of God walk across that on dry land. What was it? God keeping His Word. The deadness moved away. A living people went across. 
and a spiritually dead people tried to impersonate it and drowned it. God fulfilling prophecy and making history. That was the attraction at the Dead Sea. What was the attraction the second day after that? At Mount Sinai, when all the people was commanded not to come at their wives, when they asked to wash your clothes and sanctify themselves and gather around the mountain where a man by the name of Moses had said he met God in a pillar of fire. And God had said to Moses, I'm going to come down amongst the people. I'm going to confirm that what I told you and who I am, I'm going to show them that I am that God. That was the attraction. God fulfilling His Word. What was the attraction one day in history where a nation had forgot God, where the people had become formal and indifferent, where the priests that all went with the modern trend, the prophets prophesied according to the will of the priest. And in that day, as usual, they had one man that they thought was a fanatic. He talked about women wearing paint and everything, and he was a kind of an odd sort of a guy. And this old fellow had come down and said to the king, not even dues go to call, come until I call for it. And we find out then that he had hid himself and run away from it. And he hid out in the wilderness somewhere. The company thought that maybe he had starved to death or perished, but he had been fed pretty well. Water too. And here he was, come down. And said, Do you see that I have thus saith the Lord? Now, if you're not convinced yet, let's go up to the top of the mountain and prove who's God. For he had another vision from the Lord. He said, Choose your altar and make it, and, and choose ox and slay them. I'll make an altar of the Lord, and also I will. Put ox on mine. We'll both make a sacrifice and let the God that's God answer. He'd have by no means done that if the Lord hadn't have told him. He said so later. I've done this at all, all this at your command, Lord. But what's the attraction? It's got 400 priests standing on the hill. And the king up there in his chariot with all of his armors and guards standing around. And this old woolly, fuzzy-faced Looking man, bald head and hairs hanging down over his face. Piece of sheepskin draped around him, hairs all over his body. Standing up there with a stick in his hand, the cruise oil in the other hand. That just said, three years and a half before that, not even dew will fall till I call from it, for it. Taking the place of God with such things as halos and shatters and all they talk about. And here that old fanatic standing up there on the hill. Bringing all these people up there. What was that attraction? It was God. Amen. Fixing to vindicate His prophet to be right. Amen. It was God fulfilling prophecy. God also making history. Fulfilling the Word. A few hundred years after that, there was a man anointed with that same spirit. And he come out of the wilderness. Not connected with any organization, so his daddy was an organization man. A priest of an order. But he come out of the wilderness, dressed with a sheepskin around him. Hair all over his face. Instead of being gray, it was black. What was this man's attraction that attracted all Jerusalem and Judea? Some of them going out and said, there's a wild man down there. He's trying to drown the people in water. Who ever heard of such a thing as that? Others were curious and saying this must be the Messiah. One of them said it could be one of the prophets. They didn't know what to think. But what was it? It was God fulfilling Isaiah 40. Where he said, Behold, what he would do in the last days. I would send his servant. What he would do. Then we find a few weeks after that, that man being so 
positive of his message till he said, There's one standing in among you whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire as I baptize you with water. One day an ordinary young man, about 30 years old, walked down and was baptized. And when this man come, there was such an attraction by the prophet. The prophet acted strange that day. The congregation couldn't help from watching the action of that prophet. When he was debating with the priest across the river, they said, God built this altar. God told us to do this. Moses is the prophet. We believe Moses. The sacrifice will never be done away with. I can hear John answer back. said, Have not you read in the Scripture what Daniel the prophet said? The daily sacrifice will be done away with. That hour has arrived. Have not you read what Isaiah said in the 40th chapter? The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. There's two prophecies for me. And another thing, did not you recognize our prophet 400 years ago, Malachi, when he spoke in the third chapter and said, Behold, I send my messenger before my face to prepare the way. Amen. Don't you know this fulfills prophecy? Prophecy was being fulfilled. And about that time, the prophet turned and said, Behold, there comes the Lamb of God that Amen. takes away the sin of the world. Now, what's the attraction? It's changed from the prophet to his prophecy. Now, notice what comes to pass. Here comes an ordinary man, known of no one, a carpenter's son. Come walking out into the water. When John the great prophet said, I have need to be baptized of thee, why comest thou to me? He said, Suffer that to be so. But as a prophet and the word, it behooves us to fulfill all righteousness. So he understood the sacrifice had to be washed before presented, and he baptized him. Now, there's another attraction that takes place. When he went up out of the water, this prophet who had been so loyal to declare his age and the time, he looked up and he saw the heavens open. He saw the Spirit of God like a dove descending upon him. And a voice saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. God was vindicating a prophet's message what was attracting the attention at the Jordan. A brother sang a while ago or he was supposed to sing. On the hills far away stood an old rugged cross. What's the attraction on Mount Calvary? When we see the religious world had condemned him. And the Roman government had sentenced him to death. And here he was, hanging between two malefactors, starving for a drink, blood running out of his body. There he hangs, crying, My God! My God! Why has thou forsaken me? And the religious people Standing there looking at it. Little did they know that the prophecy of the Old Testament was being met right there at Calvary that time. David himself wrote, I fell into the Spirit like all prophets. He acted like it was him. David cried in the 22nd Psalm, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All my bones, they stare at me. They pierce my hands and my feet. David speaking like it was him. And it wasn't David. It was Christ in David. And yet the very prophecy that went forth of all the different prophets was being fulfilled on Mount Calvary. What's the attraction on Mount Calvary? God fulfilling His Word. Another attraction was on the Mount was on the day of Pentecost. When all of them was up there in religious feast, thought they got rid of all the fanatics. They hadn't heard from them for ten days. All of a sudden, like a beehive, they broke out of the top of the building, out into the streets of screaming and carrying on. What is this? What meaneth this? Are all these men drunk? 
Watch! And a prophet stood up among them, as the order of a prophet should be, and said, Ye men of Israel, and you that dwell in Judea, in Jerusalem, let this be known unto you and hearken to my words. These are not drunk like you think they are. But this is that which is spoken of by the Lord to Joel the prophet. It shall come to pass in the last days I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. That was the attraction. The religious people, after crucifying the Prince of Life and everything, still didn't see the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit. The attraction, who is this? What meaneth this? What's the matter with them people? Oh, my it's the same today. We'll bypass a lot of this to bring it to this hour. The same thing is today. The same thing is taking place. The same questions asked. What's all that racket? Look up and down the street. Carson, Michigan, to Florida, from Maine to California. This morning when I was riding out right after noon, was going down the street. Wife and I was looking at license on cars. That's where I thought of this text. What mean it? Just as it said, where the carcass is, there the eagles will gather. Amen. Amen. I said to my wife, Honey, you remember the last night when I had to say goodbye to everything that was dear to me on earth and go into the fields to start something? That God had said do. You sing that song. Oh, they'll come from the east and the west. They come from the lands afar. To feast with our king. To dine as his guest. How blessed these pilgrims are. Beholding his hallowed face. A glow with love divine. Blessed partakers of his grace. And gems in his crown will shine. That's what the attraction is. A predestinated seed of God who can't do nothing else but follow it. Amen. Means more than life to us. Amen. Take our lives, but don't take that. What is the attraction? God is usual, fulfilling His Word. He's fulfilling the Word of Zechariah. Again, the prophet Zechariah, where read the ninth verse a while ago, when Jesus entered His temple... Riding or into Jerusalem, riding on a little white donkey, the prophecy was fulfilled that Zechariah said, Here it is, rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion, shout, O daughters of Jerusalem, behold, I king is coming unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly, riding upon an ass, and upon the colt, the foal of an ass. That's what the attraction was at Jerusalem, at the religious headquarters. Now, we see a last day happening. Let's just turn a few pages on in Zechariah and see what he said about it. Let's turn it over then for the last days. That was the Middle Age. Let's turn now to the last days and turn over to Zechariah, the 14th chapter, and beginning with the fourth verse and listen. And we're going to read down a portion of the Scripture, about nine verses. From four to nine, listen close. And it's prophesying of His coming. The last days, listen close now. This is, thus saith the Lord, it's the Scripture, Zechariah 14. Remember Zechariah 9, what it said? And they didn't recognize it. Now what is it today? Zechariah 14. Speaking of His coming, and His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, again, which is before Jerusalem, on the east, on the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west. And there shall be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall be moved towards the north and half towards the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountain shall reach from Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like you fled in the days of the earthquake, in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. 
Another earthquake. Splitting open the earth. If you want to follow out a scripture here, notice in this first, fifth verse, it applies that the cleaving of the Mount of Olives is due to an earthquake. And this is confirmed by Isaiah 29, 6 and Revelation 16, 9. Exactly what is it? The same prophet told of his first coming, seen his second coming. Notice, as in the days of the earthquake, see what the earthquakes are doing, see the predictions of them. And the Lord your God shall come and all of his saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day. Hallelujah. In that day, the, the light shall not be clear or dark, but it shall be one day with one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day or night, but it shall come to pass that in the evening time it shall be light. Oh God, it shall be light about the evening time. Same prophet. And the people is blind. What's the attraction? Let's read a couple more verses. And it shall be in that day that the living water shall go forth from Jerusalem, half of them towards the former sea and half towards the hinder sea. In the summer and winter shall it be the gospel going forth both Jew and Gentile. And the Lord shall be king over the earth in that day. And there shall be one Lord and His name one. It shall be light about the evening time. Right! The way to glory you will surely find in the waterway is the light today. Buried in the precious name of Jesus. Young and old, repent of all your sins. The Holy Ghost will surely enter in. The evening light has come. It is a fact that God and Christ are one. Amen. See where we're at? Nations are breaking. Israel's awakening. The signs that our prophets foretold. That earthquake to the Gentiles to the last day, the Gentile days numbered with horrors and cumbers. Return, O dispers, to your own. You that's been kicked out in these arks, carried on new carts, get out of there before death strikes you. God has confirmed it. It shall be so. Let us turn over to another scripture in the Old Testament. Malachi, the fourth chapter. And read that little fourth chapter. Behold, a day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yea, all the do wickedly shall be as stubbles. Now this is not, that's Malachi 3 was the first coming now. Here's the next coming. Even the Dr. Schofield here, I certainly don't agree with him in his footnotes, but he's got it lined out here, right? The commission of John, the Malachi 3, and the second coming of Christ and Elijah beforehand. All the proud shall burn, up saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Where's the eternal hell then? But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness rise with healing campaigns, healing in his wings. You shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked. They shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in that day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb. For all Israel, the statutes and judgment. Here's the coming of Elijah. Behold, I will send to you Elijah the prophet. The last closing scripture of the Old Testament. I'll send to you Elijah the prophet. Before the coming of that great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now that couldn't have been John. No. 
See, the world wasn't burned up. The righteous walked out on the wicked. No, no. Before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Notice the accuracy of the Holy Spirit, that it would not confuse them two comings of Elijah. Malachi 3 said, Behold, I send my messenger before my face. Jesus asked about John. He said, If you can receive it, this is who the prophet said, I'll send my messenger before my face. This is the Elias that was to come. Malachi 3. Notice the Scripture so accurately gives it. Watch what this... To show the, them who wants to believe, them who wants to see. Remember Jesus stopped in the middle of a Scripture? Because part of it was fulfilled then to rest for His second coming. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord, bind up the brokenhearted, and stop. Not bring judgment to the Gentile until His second coming. Notice this Scripture here parallels that. And He, Elijah shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Now, speaking of Malachi 4, do not get it mixed. From Malachi 3, John, Elijah, who came in the days before the first coming of Christ, turned the hearts of the old patriarch fathers to the message of the children. The new message. Now watch. And the hearts of the children to the fathers. In his second coming, in the last days, he turns back to the apostolic faith again. Amen. See how perfect the Scriptures line up? That was the end of the Old Testament. The Old Testament. Now, we see there's light in the evening time. What is it? It's the top, Mount Treetop, as I said this morning. We've come up through denominations, through not an orange tree like I spoke of this morning, but we've had grapefruit. Lemons, all kinds of other things that wasn't like the beginning at all. But after, don't miss it, here it comes. After all the denominations is played out, they didn't have any light to begin with. There will be a day that can't be called day or night. What are they doing? What are they doing? What does a, a lemon do on an orange tree? It takes the original life of the orange that's coming up and perverts it. To a lemon. That's what the denominations has done to the Word of God. Made the Word of God of no effect by their traditions. That's thus saith the Spirit Amen. of the Lord. They have brought forth lemons, grapefruits, not oranges. But what did the prophet say? The same one that said for our text tonight, Rejoice, O daughters of Jerusalem. Shout loud, daughters of Zion. For your kings coming to you, meek and lowly, sitting upon the fold of an ass. Notice that same prophet said there will come a time of the ripening the sun sent upon the earth to ripen the fruit. Why couldn't it ripen? There's no fruit there to ripen. But the life is still traveling on. It come up to a grapefruit to be an orange. Found out it organized. It was a grapefruit. It went again. It come out that time a lemon. Went on again. It turned out to something else. And in the last top of the tree, it's turned out to a tangelo, which is half orange and half lemon. A mixed breed, a perverted thing. Come on to a perversion. Living off that same tree. The shock. Almost deceived the elect. It looks like an orange, but it ain't. But it shall be like. When she grows beyond organization. When she gets out of past organization and blooms out again. She'll put forth oranges like she was when she went into the ground. And then it shall be like. What's this attraction? What's this happening? Fulfilling God's Word. There's two witnesses of the Old Testament that this would happen. Let's take John 14, 12 of the New Testament. Jesus said, He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also. 
Also in Luke 17, 22 to 30, he said, As it was in the days of Lot, before Sodom was burned, so shall it be at the return of the Son of Man. That day when the Son of Man is being revealed. Oh, just look at the Scriptures. The Son of Man. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and forever, grow to past denominations. Grow into the top of the tree. What did He say in John 14 or 15? Every branch that's in me that doesn't bring forth the fruit, it'll be cut off and pruned, thrown into the fire and burned. Whatever branch that'll bring forth fruit, it'll be purged. Oh, there'll be a true farmer in latter rain. In the last days, upon that little group that come with him on this little donkey, low and humble, no doubt of denomination, crying, Hosanna to the King that comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. What's the matter today? What's the attraction on the mount? Not long ago, standing at this pulpit, it was said by the Holy Spirit, the day will come that when they'll drive down a stake in front of your house, they'll move your gate so that you'll bypass it. Not be angry. I seen my gate tore up and laying out upon the hillside. I seen the hill in front of me all dug up. Boards and things laying there where something mashed it up. He said, I looked and there was a little Ricky that had got up there and knocked that gate out, done this. I said, why didn't you tell me? He got smart with me. And I had to hit him. And when it did, I said, I haven't done this since I was in the ring. But I just want you to know. And I swatted him one. And when I knocked him down, I picked him up again, knocked him down again. I picked him up three or four times and kicked him over the hill. So then I went over there and I said, that ain't right. And I picked him up and shook his hands. I said, I'm not angry with you. But I just want you to know. You can't talk to me like that. And then when I turned and come back, the Holy Spirit was standing there at the gate. said, now I'll bypass this. When that stakes drove down, turned westward. This book is everything that I need. This book is a good recipe. The way the shows to go around my trouble. Amen. And that book is the Word, and that Word is God. Bypass your troubles. It'll tell you what to do. Three years ago, I heard a friend of mine, the city surveyor, lives down the lane from me driving a stake down. I went out there and said, What's the matter? Mud? Mr. King's son, personal friend, said, Billy, we're going to widen this road. You all remember? Yes, amen. I said, amen. it may be the bridge. I told Brother Woods, I said, hold your property. Maybe that bridge is going to come through up here. Something the lane was tore up. Bricks, rocks, pour all over everything. So he said, I said, hold your property. And then when I, Mr. King told me that was going to happen, I went in and said to my wife sitting there, honey, there's something written about that. Thus saith the Lord somewhere. I went and got my book, looked into it, and it said, It shall come to pass. Eight years later. Then, when I looked at it, I said, It's time now, honey. We must turn west. Two days after that, standing in the room about 10 o'clock one morning, I went into the a Spirit of God. I saw that little cluster of doves flying. Look at them little birds. You remember it. Amen. I seen seven angels in the form of a pyramid come rushing into me. Said, turn westward. Amen. Go to Tucson, be 40 miles northeast. And you'll be picking a cucklebur or a bullheader, they call it there, off your clothes. Brother Fred Softman sitting there looking at me right now. Was there that morning. I forgot about it. I said a blast went off like an earthquake that shook. For nearly everything there was in the country, I don't see how a man could survive it. I was scared. I stood at Phoenix. You all listening in tonight. Bear me record. I preached on the sermon. Sirs, what time is it? Amen. Where are we at? I went west. Many of you here got that tape. Many of you here heard it said. Amen. A year or more before it happened. 
I went west wondering what was going to happen. One day I got a call from the Lord. I told my wife, I said, Honey, I'm probably, my work is over. I didn't know. I said, God's probably finished with me now and I'll be going home. You go get with Billy. Take the children. God will make a way for you somehow. Go on and live true to God. See if the children get through school. Raise them in the admonition of God. She said, Bill, you don't, you don't know that's true. I said, no, but a man couldn't survive that. One morning, the Lord woke me up and said, get up there, Sabine, and tell them. I took a piece of paper and my Bible. The wife said, where are you going? I said, I don't know. I'll tell you when I come back. I went up in the canyon, climbed plumb up where the eagles was flying around. I was watching some deer standing there. And I knelt down to pray and raised up my hands. And a sword struck my hand. I looked around. I thought, what's that? I'm not beside myself. Here's that sword in my hand, bright, shiny, glistening in the sun. I said, now there's not people in miles of me way up here in this canyon. Where could that come from? I heard a voice said, that's the king's sword. I said, a king knights a man with a sword. He, the voice come back said, not a king's sword, but the king's sword. The word of the Lord. I said, fear not. It's only the third pull. It's the vindication of your ministry. I was going hunting with a friend, not knowing what was going to happen. And someone called me, the one that criticized me about that picture of the angel of the Lord, the one that took it. I had to go to Houston about his son, or he's going in the death row, he's going to be killed in a few days. He met me there and threw his arms around me. He said, think the very man that I criticized comes to save my only son. <laughs> you mean society give me a, what they call an Oscar, whatever you want to call it, for saving a life. Then we went back. I went up in the mountain to hunt. There, Brother Fred and I, one morning when I walked out, I'd already got my Havelina, and I looked and seen the place where we went. I said, Brother Fred, go over on that mountain early in the morning now, about to break a day, and I'll get on the other. I won't shoot at the hog, won't kill him, but if they start over this way, they herd, I'll shoot in front of them and run them back. Brother Fred went out there, and there's no hogs. He waved at me, and I seen him, went down in the canyon, some big chasms. The sun was just coming up. I come around the other side of the hill, not thinking nothing about the prophecies. Sat down, waiting, resting. I thought, what happened to those hogs? I picked up my... Sat down like Indians do, you know, cross-legged. I looked on my overhaul leg, and there was a bullheader. I picked it up, and I said, that's strange. Here I am about 40 miles northeast of Tucson. There's my little boy Joseph sitting there waiting for me. And as I started to look, I seen a herd of hogs come out about a thousand yards from me up on a mountain. I throw the bullheader down. I said, I'll get him. I'll go get Brother Fred. And I hang up a piece of paper to let know which way to go on this old cotilla here. And we'll get Brother Fred. And I start up the mountain running as hard as he could on the other side. All of a sudden, I thought somebody shot me. I never heard such a blast that shut the whole country. And when it did, standing before me was seven angels in a cluster. I met Brother Fred and I'm a little late. I said, what was that? I said, that was it. What are you going to do? Return home. For thus saith the Lord, the seven mysteries that's been hid in the Bible all these years, these denominations and everything, God is going to open those seven mysteries to us in the seven seals. Amen. There was that circle coming up from the earth like a mist forming. When it did, it went plumb up into the mountain, began to circle on westward from the way it come. Science found it after a while. 30 miles high and 25 miles across, just exactly in the circle of the pyramid. And the other day, standing there, turned the picture to the right, and there's Jesus, Amen. as He was in the seven church ages, the white wig on, showing supreme deity. He's Alpha and Omega. He's the first and the last. He is the supreme judge of all eternity. Standing there to confirm the message of this hour. Amen. And there shall be light about the evening time. What's it all about? What was it? I went westward. Up on that same mountain. Passing up with Banks Woods there. Said, throw up a rock. 
Say to Mr. Woods, Thus saith the Lord. You'll see the glory of God. The very next day, he's standing there. A whirlwind came down and blasted the mountains out. Rocks cut the top of the trees off about three or four feet above my head. Made three big blasts. The brothers come run over. There was about 15 men standing there, preachers and everything else. What was it? He said, what was it? I said, judgment is striking the West Coast. About two days after that, the earthquake almost sunk Alaska. What is this light? Up on Sunset Mountain in the Carnotto Forest of Arizona. What is this strange thing that happened up there? That the people have been driving east from west, picking up the rocks that laid around there where it struck, and every one of every one rock has three corners on it that it tore off. The three are one. Amen. They're laying on desks on paperweights across the nation. What is this strange thing up on Sunset Mountain in the Carnotal Forest? Junior Jackson listening in. You remember the dream he had at Don Turpin, going towards the setting of the sun. And this happened on Sunset Mountain. It's the evening time. Sunset time. The sunset message. To a setting of history. A setting of prophecy, rather being fulfilled. And it shall be light at the evening time up on Sunset Mountain in the Carnotto Forest, 40 miles north of Tucson. Get on the map and see if Sunset Peak there. That's exactly where it happened. I never knew it to the other day. Everything that, that shall never die, it's constantly unrolling itself. From the very thing happening to the picture being Jesus standing looking at us and now exactly on Sunset Mountain. And the sunset light, the evening light has come. God vindicating Himself. What is it? It is the facts that God and Christ are one. The white... How many seen it? The white wig upon Him as we talked in Revelation 1. See? The supreme deity. Supreme authority. No other voice, no other God, no other nothing. In Him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The angels themselves was His wig. Amen. What's happened up on Mount Sunset? God confirming His Word. That's what all this noise is about. Notice, it's God fulfilling His promised Word again of Revelations 10, 1-7. And in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel's message, the mystery of God should be finished. The hidden mystery of Revelations 10, 1 to 7, the last message to the last church age, fulfills exactly in this age St. Luke 17, 30, the day when the Son of Man shall be revealed. And there shall rise false prophets and false Christ. Show great signs and wonders insomuch to deceive the elected, if possible. The people still in doubt. And as usual, the church is just as puzzled. And the science, all through Tucson, yet the writing pieces and putting the paper way back over on Mount Lim and them big cameras, didn't see it rising up from where we were standing. Drifting on towards the west, showing the time is over. It can't go but a little piece there. It's at the west coast. Judgment struck just in the very way it went. Going right up over Phoenix, right on across. On to Prescott and across the mountains to the west coast, right on up into, where was they going? Right on up into Alaska. And she's thundering, heading right that way. And the observatories and all of them in Tucson are still asking research of science, trying to find out what it is. So high, there can't be fog, mist, or nothing up there. What did it? Where's it at? They're just as puzzled that that supernatural Halo hanging out in the sky as it was when the Magi's come in following a star saying, Where is he? That's born king of the Jews. What was it? God fulfilling his word. And there shall rise a star out of Jacob. And the God of heaven promised the evening time would have evening lights. Three years ago, this mystery was a prophecy. What time is it, sir? But now, 
It's history. It's past. The promise is fulfilled. What time is it, sir? And what's this attraction? God fulfilling His Word. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let us pray. Dear God, I have helped the people at length much longer than I intended. I pray, God, that something was said or done that will cause people out everywhere to understand. And by seeing and understanding, they might believe that Thou art the true Christ and the words that's being confirmed is a confirmation of His Word being perfect and being fulfilled in its season. Now, Lord Jesus, from Your own words, You said that the world would be in a Sodom condition. We know that. We can look at it. And You said in that day, as it was in Sodom, there were three messengers sent to the Gentile and Hebrew world. And one of them, which was God Himself, the Son of Man, revealed Himself in a human form and performed a miracle insomuch that told Abraham what Sarah was doing behind him in the tent. You said it would repeat again when the whole Gentile world would be in a Sodom condition. And we're here, Lord. Other prophecies confirming the same thing of sending Elijah in the last days, the spirit of Elijah upon the earth to bring the hearts of the fathers or the children back to the fathers. And I pray, God, that this hour that you will confirm your word, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Grant it, Father. They are all yours. I pray that you'll grant these blessings and confirm what's been said for the glory of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. To speak a word is a man. Confirm a word is God. To say something is one thing. God to do it is another thing. God don't need any interpreter. He does His own interpretation. Now we're fixing to have a prayer line to pray for the sick. God willing. And we know that there's no one, no man, no woman, no human being, no angel that can heal you. For God has already did it. He made the preparation. The only thing you have to do is receive it. There's no man, no angel, no nothing. Not even God Himself can forgive you for your sins. It's already done. Jesus did that at the cross. But it'll never prosper you anything or profit you anything until you accept it. The only thing that can be done is orders that's been given by God for believers to lay hands on the sick. That's been through the ages they've done that, through revivals. And they've called it God. Abraham's seen many signs. But there are come a time when Abraham saw his last sign just before Sodom was burned. That was God manifesting Himself in the form of a man. you believe that? Amen. Did Jesus say it would repeat? Amen. Now, how many in here and out on the radio or out on the telephones across the nation, if you're still listening in, get ready now for prayer. Be praying. You've got these handkerchiefs here. Now, I cannot tell God what to do. No, far be it from me even trying it. He's sovereign. He does what He wants to. I can only obey and only can say what He says. And now, they're standing around the walls. They're packed in. It's congested. I wonder if we could ask God on these words... What is this attraction? If God would move among us again, there may be strangers here, and move among us and show His blessed face among us, show His Spirit here, 
shown that He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, that every one of us, after these two strong messages, could believe it to be so. Could you do it? All right? Instead of calling a prayer line then, hot, congested, standing against the wall, or look around this way to call my prayer line, you couldn't do it. Look, standing there. Could have called it this way, your sick cots, everything else laying, you couldn't do it. So sit where you are and believe God. If you do have a prayer card, hold it. It'll be good. We'll get to you if you want to come to a line. But you don't have to come to a line. That Mr. Shepherd last Sunday night never come to no line. I don't, I don't guess he had a prayer card. Is Mr. Shepherd here tonight? Where is he? Is he here? He's in the back. Did you have a prayer card, Mr. Shepherd? You didn't. You didn't. You're sitting right there again tonight. <laughs> That's a good place to be, Brother Shepherd. Not only have to be there, but just have faith. Well, remember, a little woman touched his garment and he felt it. <laughs> and he's the same yesterday day, and forever. And a Hebrew letter in the New Testament said that he's a high priest tonight that can be touched by the feeling of your infirmities. You believe that? Have faith then. Don't doubt it. Believe it. And it'll come to pass. You can have what you what you've asked for if you can believe it. But you've got to believe it. Will you do it? Will all of you believe it? How many will believe it now? God bless you. I don't know who's who. I don't know none of you. It's not my business to know any of you. It's God's business to know these things. But He will do it if you'll believe it. Will you believe it now? Now, dear God, surely we're not a bunch of hybrid Christians. We shouldn't be. Somebody has to be petted and babied. You don't have that kind, Lord. You have rugged believers. The very presence of God sets a man's heart on fire. Like Abraham. He believed God. You made yourself known to him. Then you appeared to him and performed a sign. And he believed you. You turned his body back to a young man and also his wife, which his wife was part of his own body. Then come forth the new child, the promised son. God, you promised... That it be the same thing in this day. I pray that you'll confirm this word. And we'll deal right on that one promise there. That it will be like it was in Sodom. Just before Sodom was burnt and judgment struck Sodom, the Gentile world. So judgment is fixing to strike the Gentile world. And the Jews got three and a half more years through the period of tribulation, Jacob's trouble. The continuing of the 70 weeks of Daniel. But the Gentiles are numbered. It's time to go. And you give that sign and you said it would be again. Grant it, God. There it, we're in your hands. Do with us as you see fit. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Now, don't be nervous. What would it be if I was nervous? Now I'm making a thing here that it has to depend on the sovereignty of God. But why do I do this? He said it would be. That settles it. And if He makes Himself that confirmed like that before you, well, can't you believe Him? Certainly. You just have faith now and believe. Let me just look around. See where the Holy Spirit will lead. What He'll do. I don't know what He'll do. That's up to Him. But, if you'll just only have faith, only believe, all things are possible to them that believe. Do all of you believe that? Raise up your hands and say, I do believe it. With all my heart, I believe it. Now three will be a confirmation. If he'll do it three straight times to prove you that that's right. 
I don't care where you are, who you are, you just have faith and believe. I don't go stirring. Lady, Preen, I don't know you. Just sit where you're at. You don't have to come. I don't know you, but you're holding a little girl in your hand or in your lap. I'm a total stranger to you. And the little girl looks normal. She looks well. She's a pretty little girl, a little red-headed girl. Uh, looking here at her, she don't look like she's crippled or anything. I don't know what's wrong with her. It might not be for the child. It might be for you. But I just happened to see you sitting there with that child and praying. I have to talk to you a minute to catch your spirit like Jesus said to the woman, bring me a drink. See? Just to figure, figure out one person. Brother Bryant and them sitting here, I know these people sitting here. They may be needy too, but you as a stranger. Do you believe me to be God's prophet? Do you believe these things that you've heard tonight is the truth? Now, if God will reveal to me something that you've done or something you ought not have done or something's wrong with you or what your desire is, you'll know where it's true or not, won't you? And if He'll do that, will it confirm His Word that He's the same yesterday, today, and forever? And at St. Luke 17.30 is being manifested. You believe it? Now the lady raised her hand that we're strangers. I don't know you. But I'm trying to contact your spirit one person. There's so many of you pulling. Now you believe this with all your heart. Now it is for the little girl. It's not you. You're nervous. But it ain't the nervousness that's bothering you. The great thing on your heart's that little girl. You believe God can tell me what it is? You believe it? Would it help you? Would you believe then? It's a brain injury. Is that right? Now put your hand on the little child's head. Your hand. Dear God. You said these signs shall follow them that believe. They'll lay their hands on the sick and they shall recover. The woman is a believer. Her hands upon the child. May it recover. In the name of Jesus Christ, I offer this prayer. Amen. Now do you believe all of you? If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Certainly. I know the lady sitting next to her, but she's so sincerely looking this way. I can't call her name, but I, if I look at her a minute, I would know. But I know the woman by looks. But I don't know what your trouble. Do you believe I, God will let me know what your trouble is? Would, you, would it help you? Sugar diabetes. Now, if that's right, hold your hand. Certainly. Happen to be the lady laying, sitting next to you has got the same thing. <laughs> She's a stranger. The other lady's praying for somebody. <laughs> a crippled child. You'd believe with all your heart, God would grant it. Somebody back in here. Man sitting over there trying to get rid of smoking cigarettes. You believe God would take them away from you? All right. You believe? You can have it. I've never seen the man in my life. Here's a man. See that dark shadow hanging over this man right here, laying on a cot like or a chair? He's dying. He's shattered. He's got cancer. I don't know the man. Never seen him. God knows all about you. That's the truth, sir. You believe God could tell me something about you? Would it help you to receive your healing? You was brought here by a friend, but you're not from here. You're somewhere where there's a big body of water that people fishes at. It's Albany, Kentucky. That's right. Believe it, you can go back home well. Believe it, it's gone. If you don't believe it, you must believe it. Believe it's been done for you. You believe? You. From Tennessee. Got a boy, he's got asthma. Not here, but you breathe, and he'll be healed. And take your handkerchief in your hand there to him. 
He'll be healed. He'll believe it. The lady crying, sitting across from Dr. Vail there. She shattered also a dark shadow. I never seen a woman in my life. But she's got cancer. She'll die if something isn't done for her. You believe he'll heal you, lady? You can. You can have your healing. If you'll just believe. There's a little lady sitting right behind her with her handkerchief up over her mouth. She's also got ulcered stomach. Sick. You've been having passing out spells, blinding, falling out. Somebody brought you here. You got female trouble. If you'll believe, you can go home and be well. You, young man, you're a stranger sitting right here in front of me, looking at me. What are you, Puerto Rican or something? Funny man, funny me. I'm a stranger to you. You know that you're not even from my country. But you believe that God can give you the desire of your heart? If I tell you what your desire is, will you receive it? You're seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. That is true. Receive the Holy Ghost, my brother. Here's a colored man sitting way back here. Got a burden on his heart. As far as wife. She's not here even. She's got trouble with her feet. <laughs> you believe in a healer? You do? You're a stranger here. You're from across the sea. You're from Jamaica. You believe God can tell me who you are? Mr. Brady. You believe? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This lady sitting right back over in this end, next to Mrs. Wright there, she's got a burden on her heart. She's praying for a daughter. She's up for an operation. You believe with all your heart for her? She won't need it if you'll get her to believe it. I can't heal. Way back down in the nursery, I see the Spirit of the Lord, an angel, a light moving in the nursery. It's over a young woman. And she's got a spiritual trouble she's wondering about. Seems like I ought to know the woman somehow. A young woman. She's also got a female disorder. Yes, her name is Mrs. West. She's from Alabama. Miss David West. Believe. God will grant it to you. It shall be light. Amen. And in that day when the Son of Man is being revealed, if that isn't Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever, I don't know nothing about it. Do you believe that? All things are possible to them that believe. Out upon the microphones across the land now, and in this tabernacle, how many of you will raise your hands and say, I am a believer? Now you out there in the lands, everyone's got their hands up here. And way out in yonder somewhere across the nation, you got your hands up, no doubt. Now, close your eyes. Just drop your hands upon somebody near you. Take a hold of their hand. Lay it upon their shoulder. I got my hands on the handkerchiefs. Look what's been done today. Look what's done now. Beholding His hallowed face, a glow with love divine, blessed partakers of His grace, add gems in His crown to shine. Now pray. Let's pray. Everywhere. Dear God, the hour has arrived. What meaneth this? God fulfilling His Word. What's the attraction, Lord? It's God fulfilling His Word. What is this out across the nation through a, the medium of a telephone that hundreds of people have their hands laid on one another across the nation from one coast to the other? From the north to the south, east to the west. Here sits people here from foreign countries 
many of the states, Mexico, Canada, and we got our hands laid on one another. God fulfilling His Word. How is this that a person could stand here by the Holy Spirit and call a man like He did Simon Peter? Your name is Simon. You are the son of Jonas. Go get your husband and come here. I have no husband. Truly, you have five. She said, I know that Messiah is coming to do this. But who are you? He said, I'm he. And you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you promise the works that I do, shall ye do also. More than this shall you do, because I go to the Father. And behold, in the last days I'll send to you the Elijah, the prophet. And he'll change the thoughts of the people, turn the hearts of the children back to the apostolic teaching of the Bible. And it shall be light about the evening time. Here we are, great God of heaven. The hour is here. The hands are upon the people. Satan, you're defeated. You are a liar. And as a servant of God, and as servants, we command that in the name of Jesus Christ, that you obey the word of God and go out of the people because it's written, in my name they shall cast out devils and that all the people may be set free. Grant it, dear God. You are the God of heaven that defeated that day with an attraction on Mount Calvary all sickness and diseases and all the works of the devil. You are God. And the people are healed by your stripes. They are free in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God, every handkerchief that's laying here, while the Spirit of God is present, while the anointing of Jesus Christ is upon the people, and the great signs that He promised are being fulfilled, and the earth is trembling, the earthquakes are happening, the great signs that He told in the Scripture being fulfilled in the evening light shining, I lay my body across these handkerchiefs, representing this whole body of believers from east, west, north, and south, and say to the devil, in the name of Jesus Christ, leave ever patient these are laid upon. To the honor and glory of the Word of God, in the name of the Word of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Now, quietly, sanely, soberly, and in your right mind, as believers, do you now believe and accept your healing from God Almighty in the name of Jesus Christ? If you do, hold up your hands. All out in the lands. Hold up your hands out there. Every person in here, as far as I can see, had their hands up. Inside, outside, against the windows, in the doors, in the nurseries, and all around everywhere, people with their hands up. They accept it. Satan is defeated. The stripes of Jesus Christ heals you, and the presence of Jesus Christ verifies the fact that He's a living today ever able to keep every promise that He made. Amen. I believe Him, don't you? Now let us stand up to our feet. In the name of the Lord Jesus, accepting everything that's been done or said, we love Him with all of our hearts. We cherish Him with all that's in us. Now as you go to your different homes from tonight, God go with you. God give you the Holy Ghost if you don't have the Holy Ghost. Amen. Every man, woman, boy, or girl here that's not been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, there's clothes, pool. Don't put off tomorrow what can be done today. Tomorrow may be too late. Amen. Sufficient for today, for the day is the evil thereof. Amen. There's ministers standing waiting. Clothes are waiting. No excuses. Are you waiting? If you are, you believe. No matter how you've been baptized, sprinkled, poured, whatever it is, an era. The light has come. Come believe and be baptized. Everyone without the Holy Ghost, may you receive the Holy Ghost. Every one of you in the full divine power and love that He promised you Amen. to make you a new creature in Him. God bless you. Now, 
Till next Sunday morning at 9.30, let's sing this little song that we used to sing years ago. Don't forget the family prayer. Jesus wants to meet you there. He will take your ever care. Don't forget the family prayer. Let's sing it together now. Don't forget the family prayer. Jesus wants to meet you there. He will take your every care. Oh, don't forget the family prayer. As we sing it again, shake hands with the pilgrim next to you. See? As we sing it, don't forget the family prayer. Oh, Jesus wants to meet you there. He will take your every care. Oh, don't forget the family prayer. Don't you love him? I love him, I love him because he first loved me and purchased my salvation. That was attraction on Mount Calvary. The same attraction on Sunset Mountain, Mount Nebo, Mount Sinai, all the different mountaintop experiences. All right, let's sing it now. I Love him, say amen. amen. So good. Now just think of what he's done for you. Think that you could be out there in a bar room tonight. You probably would have been in the grave like I should have been outside the mercies of God. What did he do for you? Oh, how could we keep from loving him? Don't make any of what anybody says. He's first. Let's close your eyes. Bow our heads as we sing it to him now. He likes songs, singing hymns. Let's sing it to him now. our heads and hearts bowed in His presence. Gratefulness for what our eyes have seen, what our ears have heard, what's recorded in God's Word, what His promise has been to us today. God bless you. We have a, a guest with us tonight, a brother, Ned Iverson, formerly a Presbyterian minister. Fathers, brothers, our Presbyterian minister, he, I understand, was baptized today again in the name of Jesus Christ. He's a minister and a good one at that. And now I'm going to ask him, as I believe him to be God's servants, to ask God's blessings upon this congregation as you go to your home. Brother Iverson, come forward. While we have our heads bowed in prayer. God bless you, my brother.